May grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You are guaranteed very few things uh, in this life. You are guaranteed very few things. Um, it is not certain that you uh, will get the majority of things that everybody else gets. That's left up to the Lord and his will. But one thing that every person in this world is guaranteed is that you will suffer in life. And that may be a depressing note to start on. Um, but it's true. Uh, some more than others. We, but we are all guaranteed to suffer Every one of us is guaranteed. And we know that for three reasons. Eh, more than three reasons, but here are three good ones. Uh, this is my favorite. I've said it before. Uh, but we know that there will be suffering in life because the moment that you come out of the womb, somebody grabs you by the ankles, turns you upside down, gives you a whack on the butt until you cry. Okay? That's a pattern for life. Uh, Also, just general observation in our lives is that we can watch the news and read the newspaper and talk on the phone to family members and uh, look at our hospital records and see that life is actually full of suffering all over the place. Yes, there's joy. Yes, there's happiness. Yes, there are great things that happen in this world, but you're not guaranteed them. One thing you are guaranteed, though, is struggle, trouble, and suffering. The third reason I know it is because Jesus tells us. He says to us, he promises his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. Right? That's what he reminds us of. And suffering can be a discouraging thing for many people. Uh, whether because of sickness or loss or loneliness or grief, many in our world will suffer and they'll do it in bitterness and anger toward God because of the suffering that they have to endure. But in our passage today from the Apostle Paul, he gives uh, to us a theology of suffering that helps Christians see how to suffer well through things, how to struggle well through trouble, right? Uh, and in a world of bitterness and anger towards God, how to suffer and still give glory and honor to the Lord. Uh, now, for some of you listening, you're probably thinking, you know, listening to a 30-year-old talk about suffering might be a little bit tough. Uh, because what do I know about suffering? I have no chronic pain. Uh, I have had few uh, big trials in my life. I have lost very few loved ones. But my hope is that you won't listen to me, okay? But that you'll listen to the Apostle Paul through me. The Apostle Paul was a man well acquainted with grief and hardship and suffering. Uh, if you would like a resume of the Apostle Paul and his suffering, he gives us one in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 uh, through 29. He just lays out all the things that as an apostle uh, and as a, an evangelist for the Lord, all the things that he has experienced in doing his job, just in following the Lord, right? These didn't result from sin. They resulted from obedience to God. He says this, Five times I have received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst. I have often gone without food. I have been cold. I have been naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Right? About five verses, he lays out his little resume for the things that he suffered. And yet, in the book of Philippians, which he wrote uh, apparently at the same time, right? Paul doesn't talk about any of that. He talks about joy in the Lord, right? And so what Paul is exemplifying for us in the book of Philippians 
uh, is the way that we suffer as Christians uh, and the way that we can suffer as Christians so that our suffering is purposeful and not purposeless, okay? So that our suffering is, not purpose, is purposeful, not purposeless. So my question to you is this. When you suffer, uh, because the question is not if, but when, will you suffer in a way that is purposeful, not purposeless? And I have a series of questions that I'm going to ask you from uh, the Apostle Paul's writings uh, that will kind of bring this out and help us to think about it in more depth, okay? So the first question is this. Will I focus, when I suffer, when I struggle, when I have trouble in my life, right? Will I focus on my pain or on my purpose in life, okay? Will I focus on my pain or on my purpose in life? Notice how the Apostle Paul doesn't tell us what happened to him when he tells us uh, of his struggles, right? Verse 12, he says this. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And he never tells us. He never tells us. He never gives us the laundry list of stuff that has happened to him, right? Uh, he, uh, he only barely mention, mentions it. It is in no way the focus of his letter. But it could have been, right? He could have been given that laundry list from 2 Corinthians, right? Uh, and he could have said, you know, I want you to know that I'm bitter and I'm angry and I'm tired and I'm sick and I am lonely and I'm writing you this letter so that you can feel some of that, right? So you can be in some pain too, right? He doesn't do that. But some of us do that, I think. Uh, for some of us, suffering becomes an excuse for sin, I'm suffering, therefore I have the right to do evil. Uh, it becomes for us an occasion for bitterness, for anger, for mourning in an unhealthy and selfish way. It becomes for us uh, our identity, all-consuming, instead of our identity being in Christ. It becomes for us a means by which we become bitter against God and against people. Uh, and we turn back, our back on God in fury and we shake our fist at him as if he were unjust. Uh, and needed to repent to us because he's done wrong. Paul doesn't do that, though. Instead, he suffers well and focuses on his purpose in life uh, rather than his pain. His purpose was to share the love and faithfulness of Jesus. And because Paul didn't resent God in his time in jail, in his time shackled to the wall, in his years in prison sometimes, right? Because he wasn't bitter towards God. Many in prison came to know Paul, or came to know the Lord, right? Um, have you ever noticed, like just, just, just even in everyday life, how uh, pain subsides more when you don't focus on it so much, when there's something compelling ahead of you, uh, when, when you still have a purpose beyond uh, the pain that you feel or the struggle that you feel, right? But as soon as you stop, it'll catch up to you. I remember um, when I was, uh, I was a sophomore in high school and I was playing uh, baseball and I, um, I, was, I, I, I was a shortstop and so I had to run a lot of double plays, okay? And I got hit this ball and it came up and I f uh, fielded it and I went to throw to second base on a double play, right? But at the same time, the guy who was running slid into me, right? And knocked me over. I made the throw, but the guy was safe. Uh, and I played the rest of the inning and I got off the field, and my coach goes, uh, Kyle, you got to change your pants, man. And I said, why? And the guy had scraped all the way up my leg, and my leg was just bleeding down the side of my pants. It was just all red. But I didn't notice it, right, because there was a game going on, right? I had a purpose. I had a job that I needed to do, and I didn't realize that anything had happened until, like, I stopped, Right? Suffering can be the same way. If we have a purpose in our suffering, if we have a greater calling in our suffering, the Lord helps us get through it. But if we pause and just focus on all the bad and wrong things that are happening in our life, right, we can lose it. And we can just get consumed in our own pain. So here's the first question that I just asked you. Will I focus on my pain or my purpose in life? Okay, next question. Will others know about Jesus through my suffering? Will others know about Jesus through my suffering? 
one of the kind of truths of suffering, I think, is that it puts you in contact with people whom you don't usually come in contact with. Look at the, uh, the Apostle Paul here in verse 13. It says, uh, as a result of me preaching the gospel in, in prison here, as a result, it has, become clear, uh, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Right? In the midst of his pain, in the midst of his suffering, the Apostle Paul continues to uh, preach the gospel, continues to share with those whom, like, I mean, a jailer or a person in prison, somebody shackled to somebody else or shackled to a wall, is very unlike, unlikely to hear the gospel, right? But the Lord sends us into suffering, sometimes, so that other people may know, right? Whether it's a hospital bed or whether it's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's a doctor's office or whether it's uh, a missions trip or whether it's your high school or whatever, God often sends us into suffering so that other people may know, so that other people may see the Lord in the midst of suffering. And I've seen that sometimes. I maybe get to see that in a, from a different vantage point than others do, uh, where I go and visit people in hospitals. I go visit people that are struggling, and they testify to the Lord's work in the midst of suffering oftentimes, kind of to my amazement and to my encouragement uh, and to the people around them as well. Which leads into the third question. Will anyone be emboldened through my suffering? Will anyone be emboldened or will be given confidence through my suffering? Faithful suffering often inspires people. Uh, this is the reason why we read the saints or why, why we re read about missionaries or why we read about faithful Christians who have plugged away in hard situations to bring the gospel to people. It's because it inspires us, right? And this happens in verse 14 with the Apostle Paul in prison. He says, And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear, right? Um, so if you just take a few examples uh, in your life. Some of you guys inspire me as you suffer. I mean, it's, it's just, just some of you uh, people who have gone through different uh, surgeries and things like that or have chronic pain. Every Sunday, I usually see somebody hobbling their way into church, right? Uh, who get up in the morning with pain and achy bones uh, and just suffering from various things and find their way to church to be with God's people and to be in the Lord's house, right? That's an inspiring thing when we see people who say, man, I got out of bed barely today, but I'm still going to make it to the Lord's house. I'm still going to praise his name even in the midst of suffering. Uh, that does wonders in a congregation to inspire people uh, to suffer for the Lord. In the same way, uh, just to take a different example, uh, some of you high schoolers or future college students or people in your schools, you have an opportunity day in and day out to go against the grain of the culture of your high school. Okay? Whether it is people who are unkind and constantly tearing one another down, and you say, hey, you know what, even if, uh, even if this doesn't do well for my popularity status, I'm going to stick up for this person. Right? Or you have a professor or a teacher who consistently will throw God under the bus. And you say to yourself, mm, not going to do it. Even if hardship comes, I'm going to take it. Right? And I'm going to stand up for the Lord. I'm going to make his name known. Uh, I'm going to tell people about him. Right? That inspires people around you. And if you've ever seen that, I mean, whether, whether you know it or not, the first person to speak in the midst of trials, other people will start to speak too. Okay? The first person to stand up to injustices or stand up to wrongdoings around you, other people often follow suit and say, if he's going to do it, if he's going to stand up to him, if he, if he or she is going to say something in the, in the midst of this, I'm going to too. Right? And one word emboldens the next. Okay? And that's what the Apostle Paul does here. And I think that's a good question to ask for ourselves. In the midst of trials, in the midst of hardships, will our suffering embolden or give confidence to other people. Right? Next question. Will I give in to the scoffers or rejoice in people talking about the gospel? Right? So Paul says this. He kind of gives us insight to his time in prison that while he's preaching the gospel, so are others, actually. 
uh, it's, he says this. He says, It is true that some p preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former... They preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in prison. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. So when Paul is in prison, uh, there are people who are also sharing the gospel, also talking about Jesus, uh, because they want other people to know, right? But there are other people who are talking about Jesus in order to get Paul in trouble, right? Maybe to get him 40 more lashes. Maybe to get him uh, time in solitary confinement. They'll say, oh, you know, Paul told me about this guy named Jesus. He's really wonderful. I'm going to follow him. I'm not going to give honor to Caesar anymore. So that Paul will be thrown further in the hole and get into deeper trouble, right? But Paul shakes it right off and says, eh, doesn't matter much to me. Because whether Christ is being talked about falsely or whether Christ is being talked about truly out of, out of a heart of love, it doesn't matter much. We're talking about the name of Jesus, and that is powerful. And I think that gives me confidence in a world where people don't have much to say about God that's kind, don't have much to say about God that is, uh, that's not just throwing him under the bus. For me to take up my own cross and for us to take up our own cross and say, yeah, you want to talk nasty about the Lord? Let's talk about him. Because I believe powerful things happen when we do talk about the Lord. Uh, whether you want to talk about, about him out of vain conceit to get, make me look bad or make God look bad or not. Let's talk about him. Let's bring out the name of Jesus because it is powerful to us. So will we give in to the scoffers uh, or rejoice in people talking about the Lord? Next question. Will my confidence and hope be in the Lord no matter what happens? Paul goes on in verse 18 and 19. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, he said, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If, uh, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So if the Lord leaves him here, he says, great, I'm going to go on struggling, I'm going to go on fighting, I'm going to go on proclaiming the good news because I know it is powerful. And if the Lord takes me home, great. Either way, I expect and know that God's, uh, God, God's will is with me uh, in all things and that he will deliver me from suffering. I think that we can be confident in this, whether the sun's shining in our lives or not. Uh, that God leads us through both the valleys and the mountaintops. And we can be sure uh, that his promise is good, that he will deliver us uh, from all things. And that can give us peace, right? I talk to some of you uh, in the midst of sicknesses or trouble or uh, maybe nearing the end of life or things like that. And there's this kind of sentiment that many of you will say where it's like, well, the Lord takes me home, great. The Lord leaves me here, that's good too. Right? And that is kind of the posture of a Christian. Uh, is that we recognize the hope that's, that's in front of us and also the good work that's in front of us too and are satisfied in either, whether the Lord's asking us to plug away in the harvest field uh, or follow him home. The last question. Will I stick it out if he asks me to? Will I stick it out if he asks me to? Some of you have been suffering for a long time. Ailments, injuries, discouragement, sickness, you name it. Uh, and you are ready for the Lord to take you home and bring you relief. But he doesn't, right? He keeps you in the game. Uh, you're like a football player, in my mind, who's been in uh, the game for four quarters and has been getting beaten up on, pummeled uh, for the whole game. You haven't taken your helmet off since you walked on the field, right? 
You wave to the coach to send someone else in to give you some relief, to, to nurse your wounds so that you can go back out later, and he doesn't do it. He, lets you, he just lets you keep being pummeled, right? And you have the option of saying, nah, that's it. I'm going to sit down. You know, I'm, I'm not staying on the field, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not going on any longer. But the Lord asks us to keep playing the game, to keep suffering through the hurts, uh, the tiredness, being beaten up, uh, because the Lord has for you in the game a purpose. Suffer faithfully until the buzzer. That's what the Lord calls us to do. When he says, uh, I, had qu I quoted him from John right at the beginning, when Jesus tells us, in this world, you will have trouble. Right? That is a promise for the days when we walk the earth. Right? But Jesus has another promise that comes right after that. He says, in this world, you will have trouble, but behold. I have overcome the world. And we can be completely confident in this. In conclusion, um, I want to talk about a, a, a missionary. He's an American missionary to India. His name was E. Stanley Jones. And he has a great quote uh, that I think articulates much of what Paul uh, is trying to summarize. He says this, Don't just bear trouble. Use it. Don't Bear trouble, but use it. Take whatever happens, justice and injustice, pleasure, pain, compliment and criticism, take it up into the purpose of your life and make something out of it. Turn it, he says, into a testimony, right? Into a work of the Lord, that the Lord's seeing you through these things. Paul didn't just bear trouble, right? He used it as a testimony uh, for the Philippians. Uh, it, Christ is the same. He didn't just bear trouble, but used it to redeem you and me from the cross, right? May you also not simply bear suffering or bear trouble, but use it for the Lord's good purposes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, may we uh, bear suffering uh, and use it too, Lord. May you guide us to, and strengthen us through your spirit. God, we know that we cannot rejoice in the midst of suffering without you, uh, without your spirit and your good news that we have hope in all troubles. We have hope in all trials and in all struggles, Lord. Uh, and in the midst of suffering, you promise us uh, that you will do something good through it for our good purposes and for your good purposes. May it be so, Lord, in your name. Amen.